it's great to see the turnout here today, and I think that I think that itself is a good community health indicator uh, of, of community engagement and what we're up to. I just finished my my 17th year in San Antonio, and uh, just a one-minute reflection on how far we've come. My first, my very first day in clinic uh, in, uh, in uh, April of 1997 was in the Well Child Clinic. And uh, after I had seen about the fourth or fifth kid in a row with a mouthful of metal teeth, uh, which I had been in a lot of poor clinics, up, mainly in the Northeast where I was from, I, uh, I had to leave the exam room and go and find one of my colleagues and say, what is it with San Antonio and all these kids with mouths that look like James Bond villains? And they said, no fluoride in the water. And I said, oh, okay, now I get it. And so the fluoride quickly followed um, and started to solve some of that problem of the three-year-olds with mouths full of metal teeth. But it was a great example of exactly what Charles was talking about, was the, uh, the power of you know, public policy and social determinants and doing things at a community level rather than relying on people to do really simple things like fluoride one by one where you know, parents have to go and buy drops instead of it just being in the water. So the, the, we have equivalents of just being in the water for uh, healthy food systems and healthy public spaces that allow people to be active in a, and about 30 other you know, policy initiatives that are on the road to enacting here in San Antonio. So it's been a really great trajectory. And uh, I think the, the attendance here this morning reflects the path. So my, uh, my task right now is to introduce Mr. Richard Perez, who's the president and CEO of the San Antonio Chamber of Commerce. He is a homegrown, grew up in San Antonio, a product of the South San Antonio schools. Uh, has a, had a, really a, a succession of very responsible jobs, including being assistant to the city manager of Laredo. Uh, in the Clinton administration, he was special assistant to the deputy, deputy secretary of housing and urban development, which is, uh, for some reason, I'm thinking that's an organization we've heard a lot about recently. I can't remember why. Uh, he worked in the family business after that for several years, and then he was elected to represent the city council district four. And following that has been uh, now the leader of the San Antonio Chamber, where he's led many initiatives, including Riverwalk Extension, a lot of business expansions, uh, parks and library initiatives, PK for SA, uh, water projects, and many, many others. He serves on a lot of local boards, and I don't want to take any more of his time because he has a very long bio, so I'm, I'm very pleased to welcome Mr. Perez. So you all know this, but um, as the uh, head of the Chamber of Commerce, the uh, San Antonio Chamber of Commerce, of course, business and industry is what we're all about. And so I want to just talk a little bit about the industry itself. As you all know, one of every six people that work in San Antonio, Texas, work in the healthcare and biosciences industry. One in every six. So you all are a special group of people. And you all, in fact, are part of the largest economic driver in San Antonio. Uh, approximately $29 billion economic impact on this community every single year. So the things that you all are doing to help people stay well and, and promote uh, healthy lifestyles are very, very important. But it also includes uh, scientists, it includes medical device uh, development, uh, research, uh, all the doctors and technicians. So you put all that together and it's about a $29 billion economic impact on our uh, economy. I want to say that healthcare and bioscience industry is more than just jobs and it can impact economic impact, however. We're here to talk about how this industry sector works with all other industries to build a healthier and stronger San Antonio. It's really about healthier people and healthier families. I believe businesses must take the lead in our city's health initiative because our business leaders can have the most powerful impact on our entire community if we simply make it easier for our employees and our customers to be healthy. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Let me start by now talking a little bit about, I talked about how important healthcare about science is. Let's talk about some of the things that you all live every single day. Some of the not so good numbers. As you all know, San Antonio has been named the second most obese city uh, in the country by the Centers for Di Disease Control and Prevention with a rate of over 35%. It's worth noting, however, that we recently uh, dropped that rate to 28.5%. In a recent survey by Gallup, San Antonio was ranked the second fattest city in the country. San Antonio's rate for diabetes is 14% higher 
than both the state of Texas average at 10% and the national average at 9%. While the community has seen steep declines, the Bear County teen birth rate was still 46% higher than the national rate at the end of 2012. And in 2012, teen childbearing was estimated to cost nearly $60 million in Bear County alone. The rate of STDs in our community remains over two times the Texas average and over three times the national average. And in Bear County alone, over 260,000 people continue to struggle to get adequate nutrition. So why is health and wellness good for business? Well, a recent study by Iran, a nonprofit research organization, charted the successful savings of companies that help employees manage chronic illness through health and wellness programs. In their study, companies saved nearly $4 for every $1 invested in health and wellness programs. Research is currently not in agreement on the true return on investment of everyday wellness programs, although employer studies and interviews have shown that these programs increase morale and positive production for employees. Companies will be able to increase incentives, incentives for employees who participate in workplace wellness programs, a result of the Affordable Care Act. And with an estimated 63% of businesses currently offering these types of programs, the terms of the ACA workplace wellness provisions is a hot topic with many community and businesses all across the country. So let's talk a little bit about health and wellness is good for economic development. While the San Antonio continues to peak compete on a global scale to attract business and talent for our community, we are faced with the challenge to become a healthier, more transient, and more connected city to cater to the needs and desires of young professionals. That is a challenge that we still have as a community, attracting young professionals to our community. If you look at Forbes' recent report of the 10 best cities for young professionals, you'll see communities such as San Francisco, Washington, D.C., Boston, Austin, Denver, and others. All of these cities feature brands, their own brand of advertising for their city, a healthy, energetic, a walkable, livable community. That's what they're all about. That's how they're attracting all this young talent. If you refer, I refer back to some of the lists I mentioned a little while ago, where San Antonio ranks highly in unfavorable categories, the cities I just named often, uh, are, which are significant competitors, they rank much, much lower than us. So we, that's where our challenge is, right? The perception and the reality of where we're at in comparison to all these other cities that we're competing with on a daily basis to bring industry and business. For example, Washington, D.C., Denver, Boston, and San Diego all boast spots on Forbes' latest Healthiest Cities in America report. And it's no coincidence that these cities also rank as top destinations for talented workers across the country. As San Antonio continue, continues to develop its urban core, and as we track initiatives such as the Mayor's Fitness Council and the SA 2020 goals, we are definitely seeing progress, but there is more that we can do together. So let's talk a little bit about what businesses can do and what businesses are doing. You know, your workplace may be the only positive role model for employees that has an opportunity to change habits. You know, I, I'm a, a Hispanic, Hispanic. Mexican-American, and I don't remember a single time uh, at home, and this is no slight on my, my parents, that we ever talked about healthy foods. We just went to eat, my folks served food, and we ate it, whatever was there. Now, we always had an abundance of fruit and vegetables, so that was nice, but we all know that not all families have that. And so, businesses are increasingly becoming the place for employees to learn about uh, wellness, healthy food, and fitness. So I'm going to tell you a little story. So the chamber, uh, I have a staff member at the chamber. By the way, there's 26 folks that work uh, with me at the Chamber of Commerce. And I have a staff member that started working uh, at the chamber at the age of 16 years old. Uh, she started as an intern in our IT shop, and she's a fantastic, fantastic employee and just a lovely person. Um, but when she came to the chamber, it was pretty clear that she was suffering from several health uh, issues. Uh, she was obese. Um, she didn't get any exercise. Uh, she had no exercise, in fact. She was a, uh, a young mother. 
So she, she a fantastic employee, but clearly um, she um, she needed some help. And so I understood right away that the habits that she had growing up were habits that she learned at home. That's where she found all these things out. And so three years ago, we began a wellness program at the chamber. Uh, the wellness program consisted of folks coming in to talk to my staff about dieting, uh, healthy snacks, choices, you know, during the day, uh, uh, different opportunities for exercise, low impact, medium impact, high impact. We did walking, we did jogging, we did uh, Pilates, uh, yoga. Believe me, we did it all. And because we were trying to find the things that people like the most. We didn't want to be uh, one flavor for all, but we wanted to show that there's many different opportunities for people to uh, begin a healthy lifestyle. So we might begin it three years ago, and this individual really got involved. Uh, she start, and all of us started off very slowly, right? You don't want to put shorts on at work. It's, it's kind, of a, kind of a weird thing, uh, so it's a little embarrassing. But, but we're a family, right? That's your second family at work, and so we all got used to it and uh, began to attend these classes regularly. And we did it in the afternoon, and sometimes we did it over lunch. And everybody brought a healthy lunch. The idea was to bring a healthy lunch so that we can kind of show each other what we're doing and kind of work off each other and play off each other. So, uh, so she began to, again, attend regularly, began to exercise. And I'm happy to report that after about two and a half years, after really working very, very hard, this individual lost 80 pounds. She has, uh, for the last two years, run in the Rock and Roll Marathon and completed the marathon both years in a row. And right now, she's training for a triathlon. Clearly, the ability that I had as CEO and to encourage all of my employees had a very direct and dramatic impact on this individual. And I can tell you, we're all very proud of her. If you see a picture of her what, three years ago and what she is today, you would not believe it's the same person. Now she's taken that she's got a son. She's taken that home to her son, and her son now eats healthy snacks and is involved in sports. And so, again, my point is that, that at the office, the ability to uh, impact people's um, uh, choices and the things that they do at home is very, very real. And so that's why I think that businesses have such an important role to play. The workplace is key. So this program didn't just transform this one employee, although her example is very, very strong. We now have an ongoing health uh, wellness program at the office that many, many of us participate. We come in and out depending on the workload, but at minimum, we all go to these visits and talk and, and are involved in our wellness. And in fact, we now have cut out breakfast tacos uh, at our offices in the morning. Sort of, sort of, sort of, sort of. Yeah, that's a tough one. But, so we're still moving to try to do that. But my point is that, and this program, by the way, is a program that was offered uh, by the uh, Medical Foundation's wellness program. It was a free program. They came to us and said, hey, we want to provide this free program to all employees, uh, employers of San Antonio. Can you help us promote it? And I said, well, yeah. Why don't we start at the chamber? And it's been a fabulous success. And so my point is that there are programs out there, programs that you all deal with on a daily basis that are helping businesses uh, have better and more healthy employees. And they're carrying that home. And they're carrying that to their church. They're taking that to their children's schools. They're taking that to the PTA meetings. And that's why businesses and the ability of business to affect people's lives is so important. But you have to have leadership from the top. And so um, we have other community partners like HEB, USAA, Valero. They have very, very well-defined programs that are very successful as well. But it's the smaller medium to, to, to small businesses like the chamber, like not-for-profits, that need all the help that they can get. And I can tell you that the Wellness Coalition is there, ready to help, and we're happy to provide you any information that we can. So, in closing, let me thank you all for the fantastic work that y'all are doing. Uh, the Health Collaborative is an amazing opportunity for us to know where we're at today and know where we want to go tomorrow. And so I'm very pleased to be a part of uh, this morning's uh, opening. I thank you for the opportunity to be here, and together we'll continue to make San Antonio a better, healthier city. Thank you very much. Greg Eastman, he's a, a board member of the Bear County Health College.
Lafferty, the CEO of Community First uh, Health Plans, and he will introduce uh, Mr. Ramiro Cavazos of San Antonio Hispanic Chamber. Good morning and welcome. I too would like to thank you for your attendance and participation in today's event. As the Secretary Treasurer of the Health Collaborative, it's my pleasure today to introduce our second keynote speaker. Mr. Ramiro Cavazos is the Chief Executive Officer of the San Antonio Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, which is America's first Hispanic business organization. It was founded in 1929. In this role, he provides direction on small business issues, international trade efforts, economic research, leadership development, education expansion, workforce growth, and small business advocacy. His extensive background in economic development has uniquely prepared him for this role. He, was, he has served as the Director of Economic Development for the City of San Antonio during an unprecedented period of economic growth by recruiting to Toyota Motors Manufacturing, Maxim, Microsoft, and helping to retain Rackspace, DPT Labs, and several others. He's also served as the Director of Research and Economic Development for the University of Texas Health Science Center, where he helped secure needed funds for the expansion of the Medical Arts and Research Center and the South Texas Medical Center. While in private practice, he represented Levi Strauss, the Levi Strauss Foundation in Texas, Mexico, and the Latin American region as Senior Manager for Global Public Affairs. He's even owned his own communication company and advised companies such as AT&T, HEB, and Valero Energy. He's also even taught economic development at the University of Texas at San Antonio. And he's even had a role in public affairs serving as the Campaign Manager for Bear County Judge Nelson Wolf when he was elected mayor of San Antonio. He's earned a Master of Public Administration degree from St. Mary's in San Antonio and has been awarded the Distinguished Alumnus Award. It is my pleasure to welcome Mr. Ramiro Palacios. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for the invitation. I, uh, as, as I look out, I see many familiar faces, many friends. Uh, your work is powerful, and uh, we at the Hispanic Chamber see that the best way to address healthcare issues is through education. As you all know, if you have an educated patient, if you have an entrepreneur that has the ability to have the key to open doors for their business, for their employees to create wealth in their companies, uh, that makes them uh, people that can address their own challenges, their own employees' needs, and have the information to address many of the goals in your chip. Uh, we can't just measure goals. We need to find a way to improve and meet those challenges. And I wanted to just share with you uh, uh, a few words about uh, the work that we're doing to partner with you. A few years ago, we did an economic impact study on the bioscience and healthcare industry, and as my great friend and colleague Richard Perez pointed out, one out of six people in San Antonio are employed in the bioscience and healthcare industry. As, as you all heard, I worked at the Health Science Center for a couple of years doing research and economic development and helping raise funds for the mark uh, for Dr. Cigaroa and Dr. Brian Herman and the team over there. Uh, but it, it's very clear to me that uh, if you look at San Antonio's history, we're a city that's almost 300 years old. Uh, but we didn't get our first graduating class from a medical school in San Antonio until 1970. And the class was a class of 20 people. And now, uh, now 44 years later, in that trajectory of 300 years of economic history, uh, it is now the largest uh, economic generator in our community. Uh, so this city is definitely on the upswing in the short time that we've had an institution like the UT Health Science Center located here in San Antonio. Uh, it's transformed your industry, and many of you are uh, individuals that were trained either at the medical school, the nursing school or the uh, School of Applied uh, Health, 
but one of the things that, as I look out at the audience, I see that most of you all are, are women. And our analysis a few years ago, the bioscience healthcare industry study, also looked at other industries. And we formed a, about six years ago, after I left the city to do economic development for the chamber, an institute called the Saber Institute. You all know in Spanish, Saber stands for knowledge. But it actually stands also Strategic Alliance for Business and Economic Research. Uh, it's an acronym. We partner with Dr. Steve Niven at St. Mary's University, who was my chief economist at the city when we were recruiting uh, companies to San Antonio. And his analysis showed something very striking. He said, Ramiro, there are more women in the bioscience and healthcare industry, employed in the bioscience and healthcare industry, than in other in any other industry. I said, well, that's great news, Steve, but uh, thank you for that data point. Uh, and then he goes, but there's another industry, and it's the real estate and construction industry. And in that industry, more men are employed in that industry per capita than, than in any other industry. And I said, well, that's great to know, Steve. Uh, any, anything else you need to tell me? He goes, well, it gets even better, I mean. I said, okay. Uh, this is an economist really trying to, uh, you know, make an impact in, in the people. He goes, the healthcare and bioscience industry, not only are there more women in that industry, but it's the industry with very little turnover. These people, when they get a job, they keep it. And, and they're, they're dedicated. And the average wage for people in bioscience and healthcare in San Antonio, the largest industry, as Richard said, is better on average than other industries. So you're in an industry that's extremely powerful. It's an industry that generates great uh, wealth for our community in addition to, to wellness. I said, tell me again about that construction real estate industry, Steve. He goes, well, it's mainly men. And the turnover rate is very high. Okay, so he goes, they don't keep their jobs uh, as long as the people in the bioscience and healthcare industry. And the average wage is not as strong as the bioscience and healthcare industry. So I said, so, you know, so we try to figure out what's the summary of this analysis. Well, we figured out, now we figured out why men marry women. <laughs> because women can keep their jobs. <laughs> and they make more money than men in the real estate and construction industry. And, and so, you know, I tell you that story because that's the type of data that is showing San Antonio's uh, need to have a diverse economy. We need all industries, information security, information technology, aerospace, uh, of course, bioscience, our tourism industry is great. Average may not be, uh, wage may not be as high, but these are great entry level jobs. A lot of our young people get their first job working at a restaurant or at a hotel, and they graduate to bioscience and healthcare. So I'm very excited to be here today because I love uh, what you all bring to our community. And let me share very briefly uh, what we are doing at the Hispanic Chamber. Uh, you know, I worked at the Health Science Center uh, a couple of years, and I can tell you that for me it was uh, a blessing to, to see the work, uh, how you alleviate pain in families, how you address healthcare disparities in our community. I worked for the Levi Strauss Foundation for six and a half years, and I was very fortunate to provide AIDS education and prevention grants uh, in communities where we had a business presence focused on Latin America. I got to work from San Antonio, but I got to go into the barrio in Chinatown in Sao Paulo, Brazil. I got to go to Santiago, Dominican Republic to do an audit of a contractor and, and provide grants to nonprofits in those communities. So I learned about uh, really some amazing things that uh, are needed in our community. And it gets back to education. And treating problems is not often uh, the way we address them. Uh, in fact, one of our grants to a nonprofit in Mexico City was to a nonprofit that had been formed uh, by uh, working women in uh, uh, the inner city. Uh, they were prostitutes. Uh, 
Uh, they formed their own nonprofit to raise funds and grants for their needs. And the grant that the Levi Strauss Foundation provided was to provide condoms to women who had no access to condoms to address chlamydia and STDs. One of your goals here. And, and so we need to look at healthcare in a very fundamental in a very practical way. And it's not always the way we may think we should address the problem. Sometimes you address it by giving people the tools that they need uh, to prevent the spread of disease. Uh, you all saw this week that we sent a thousand National Guardsmen to the border to deal with a seven-year-old girl that, uh, and 51,000 other uh, young people are here to try to get uh, access to that American dream, uh, to get health care and to find their parents. Uh, I don't know that that's a very practical way to address uh, a, a human problem that we as Americans uh, need to address. In a way. Uh, so we need to expand Medicaid. We're foregoing billions of dollars of economic impact because of the opinion, of, again, of people in Austin that don't represent us. Uh, that's a tremendous lost economic impact. Uh, you heard from many earlier representing Senator Van Der Poot, uh, that 40% of uh, South Texans do not have access to health care. That's unacceptable. Uh, and oftentimes people trying to do away with the Affordable Care Act are people that have access to health care. And so we need to treat each other uh, as neighbors, as family, as, as friends. And at the Hispanic Chamber, we have taken a very strong position on these issues, on immigration reform, on Medicaid expansion. Um, the Affordable Care Act resolution is the law of the land, and rather than continue to beat it up, let's make it work. And so again, it gets back to being fundamental and practical. Um, you know, we uh, talk about access to health care, but if people don't have uh, cognitive skills or basic access to, to uh, you know, math, and algebra, uh, we were the only chamber in San Antonio that supported Algebra 2 being a requirement in all schools in Texas because if you take that away, that right from a young person who doesn't know any better in high school, if they can opt out, they're not going to get the, the fundamental and practical skills that they need to make wise decisions. And so that's another important thing, getting back to my first point, access to economic development, to prosperity education will make you a healthier person and will also make you less likely to become a criminal in your lifetime and to uh, have some of the social ills that we end up having to pay more money in the long run for than addressing them uh, in the pre-k uh, years I'm very proud of Richard and the work he and many of our leaders have done on uh, the pre-k for SA program we were very much in support of that program and uh, are very excited about the future potential for young people, to, everyone, to have access to, uh, of course, uh, Head Start. Uh, and it's not just babysitting, it's actually teaching our young people about uh, health, about fruits and vegetables and, and eating well. And you don't do that by just babysitting, you do it through actual education. So we are very aggressive with uh, the expansion, not just of, of Medicaid, but Pre-K for SA, and five years ago, we received a $250,000 grant from the AT&T Foundation. And it was focused on middle school kids in the inner city. We work with Harlandale, Southwest, Edgewood, South Sand, and SAISD. Uh, we have 6,000 children a year, young people, who uh, we open their eyes over three days to the magic and the economic uh, fun of science, technology, engineering, and, and math. We call it Core 4. So we have, we're entering our sixth year running Core 4 STEM conference. We brought in Dr. Bernard Harris, who's the first African-American uh, astronaut who grew up in San Antonio. Bob Ballard, the first uh, the discoverer of the Titanic. Uh, and of course, Jose Hernandez, who was the first, one of the first Latino astronauts who was a migrant farm worker to talk to young people. And on a weekend, their families are open to go to UTSA, St. Phillips, and Palo Alto during the expo. And so if we can get more of our young people, if we are 70% of the population in San Antonio, we should be at least 70% of the educated workforce and at least 70% of the folks with an economic 
prosperity that is above the national average. It's not just about raw numbers. And so our core four STEM expo, our sixth annual will be this November, and we do that for 6,000 young people every year. And we're very proud to be making our contribution to build that pipeline of workers for your industry. And we get many of you all to come in and speak to us. And most recently, we also had our Small Business and Healthcare Summit. We had over a thousand people that met to learn about uh, the importance of, uh, you know, healthcare track in everything that we do in work. Uh, we provided, of course, health screenings, uh, thanks to Baptist Health System. I want to also recognize Dr. Patrick Carrier, the Children's Hospital. Again, another thing that is, has been unacceptable for too long is not having a tier one state-of-the-art Children's Hospital in San Antonio and they're beginning to address that. Let's give them a round of applause. Uh, I want to thank Pilar Oates for the leadership she provides. We work with her for all of our healthcare summits every year. Uh, I want to uh, commend, uh, the, uh, of course, uh, Methodist and, and the work that they've done with the Hispanic Chamber for many, many years to help fund our, our, our conferences. Uh, Palmira Ariano uh, for her work. Uh, Charlene Doria, she and I worked together in the 90s on AIDS education and prevention efforts. Charlene, thank you for the great work you've done with the Ryan White program for many, many years. And, uh, and all of you, I hate to single out people, but each of you is special. As I said, you all keep your jobs longer, and we appreciate that. You are a great economic generator for our community, and at the San Antonio Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, you know, it's about substance, and it's about making a difference, and doing our small part to play a part in the success that you are bringing to making our city healthier and making our city more economically prosperous. So please have a great day, and, and we're very honored to be here today uh, to share uh, brief remarks and our message about the importance of economic development. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. So it has been my pleasure and my privilege uh, to be able to facilitate the planning sessions that led to the document that you see on your tables. And uh, this has been a six-month process. We began um, in December of 2013 um, thinking about and reflecting on the 2012 CHIP and thinking about um, what we were proud about, what still troubled us in the community, um, what successes we wanted to acknowledge, what assets we had in the community that we could mobilize, and what we learned from the latest round of data collection and analysis from the community health assessment to tell us where we needed to focus and redouble our efforts. So over that six month period, um, the working groups, which ranged in number from about 30 to up to 50 um, individuals meeting for three hours at a time, over five sessions, the working groups uh, kind of uh, ratified some elements and validated some elements of the previous CHIP, but also updated that previous CHIP to reflect the changes in the environment um, and, and some of the new focus um, areas that we wanted to address. So um, what I said 
every month when I came to San Antonio. And those of you who were part of the sessions can nod and say, yes, yeah, she did, yes, yeah, she did, was that um, I always leave San Antonio more energized than when I arrived. And um, being with this group of just incredibly committed, passionate, knowledgeable people month after month was just um, a very um, affirming and wonderful experience. So I want to give a hand to all of you before I start. Thank you for your dedication. So slide. We'll see how this works. Slide. Okay, excellent. Um, I want you to take this document in front of you, the bound document. This is the final chip. And um, as was mentioned by our, our keynote speakers, health is a really hot topic now. And there has arguably never been a better time in our history to uh, begin thinking about creative and collaborative solutions to some of the systemic issues and barriers uh, that impact our ability uh, to be healthy in our community. Um, and this is your plan. The reason it's called a community health improvement plan is because it is created by, owned by, mobilized by, and sustained by the community. It is not a document for one entity to take on. It is a document for everyone to use to think about ways that they can partner, to think about ways that they can share resources, to think about ways that they can piggyback their efforts on other efforts to really um, enhance the impact in the community. So I hope that within a year's time, these documents that you see in front of you will be marked up, dog-eared, pages half hanging off, because it's a living document that you're referring to and that you're using um, in your day-to-day -day work, in your day-to-day -day lives, as you're beginning uh, to make decisions about how to improve the community's health. So um, we began, as I, as I mentioned, in reflecting on some of our successes, some of our ongoing challenges, and then we went back to um, the vision of the previous CHIP, and we really affirmed that this was the vision that we all wanted to hold for ourselves in this community. Um, the vision is kind of that, that overarching aspiration for what we're trying to achieve. And as mentioned by the keynote speakers, um, San Antonio will go from being known as one of the most obese cities in the country to um, being known as a very positive and healthy place to live um, with organizations that are working together um, to sustain um, improvements in public health. And if you notice, um, in each of the bullets of the vision statement, there's some really key words um, that the working groups and, and um, those leading these efforts wanted to include as part of our conceptual elements. That's the notion of aligning and coordinating. The CHIP is not a replacement document. It is an integrating document. So the idea is to have this framework to align and coordinate our efforts, to model collaboration, to ensure access to health resources, open access, equitable access, to create opportunities in the community where opportunities do not currently exist, to support those who are working to support the environment, and to sustain this work through uh, conversations, through planning, through sharing our metrics, and through having events like these um, to really kind of come together and think about our community. So um, this vision was crafted uh, several years ago with thoughtfulness and, and passion and purpose, and it remains the guiding vision for the CHIP. Slide, please. We also felt that it was really important to um, affirm and reaffirm some of the values and operating principles that we hold um, as we develop the CHIP and as we hope to execute and implement uh, the strategies in the CHIP. Um, so this is, again, that idea of integrating work and breaking down silos to transform our community in innovative ways, um, to disagree with each other when we need to, but to do that in a creative and productive way so that we can really move the needle. Um, to focus on results and on measuring those results, 
and to really um, have a primary eye towards um, equity and, and integration. So we spent a fair amount of time clarifying these values, and these are the principles and, and values that are essential um, for building uh, shared understanding and shared leadership, but also um, in supporting true collaboration. Slide, please. We also spent some time talking about this notion of the braid and came up with this visual graphic, the idea that we recognize that we're all connected and we can't do our work alone. These are complex issues we're trying to address. Um, so we need to connect our work and integrate our work to be successful. So these chip focus areas, and there are five of them, are interdependent and they have this common core of healthy communities and healthy systems um, to really kind of bind these elements together. But this is the notion of the braid. Slide, please. Um, again, uh, we were very intentional and very respectful of the idea that planning is a fluid process, but we also want to make sure that our discussions mirrored other discussions, reflected priorities and other plans, so uh, very intentionally um, aligned our discussions with SA 2020, but also as much as possible tried to bring other planning efforts, other initiatives, other um, uh, strategies already underway into our conversations with the CHIP. So again, we're not replicating, we're not duplicating, um, we're not replacing, but we're integrating and aligning. Next slide, please. Here's the CHIP by the numbers. <laughs> For those of you who like these, <laughs> who like numbers, um, there are 27 different objectives uh, across this chip, which is a fairly manageable amount across five priority areas. These objectives are phased over the next two years, and the focus on these objectives is really, again, what is actionable, what is measurable, and what is realistic. So we really tried to make sure that our, our conversations were, were aspirational but bounded um, in the reality of what we could accomplish. And then across each of these areas, you'll see the number of strategies associated with each of them. Next slide, please. And now what I'd like to do is just walk you through um, the elements, very briefly, uh, the elements of the chip. Um, you'll see the great detail behind them in this bound document. Um, but we have five different um, focus areas for the chip. They are the same as in the previous chip. The goal statements have been slightly modified. Um, the objectives have been narrowed um, and, and made even more measurable. And you'll notice that in this document, we have um, target and baseline um, data points to help track and measure our progress right above you know, each of the strategies that we're hoping to adopt. So the first area that we're looking at is healthy eating and active living. The goal is uh, to support equity in healthy eating and active living and wellness uh, to make sure community members can make the healthy choices that help them to lead healthy lives. And if we look at page 16 of the document, you can see um, uh, a listing of the, the issues, those determinants that contribute to um, illness, what, what makes us sick, um, including limited access to healthy foods, the proliferation of fast food restaurants, um, and physical activity levels declining despite uh, the increase in resources um, for physical activity. Um, so it's next slide, please. Um, as we look at the objectives across the chip, um, there is an objective to establish a chapter for health and wellness in the city comprehensive master plan. This is a developmental objective, and throughout the plan, where an objective is noted as developmental, it's an area where we do not have current data, where we're looking to establish baseline data and then track uh, progress over time. So that's something to make note of. Um, you'll see a couple objectives here about increasing consumption of fruits and vegetables and decreasing consumption of sugar-sweetened beverages uh, for adults and children, um, a focus on physical activity for adults and children with the overall aim of reducing the percentage of adolescents and adults who are overweight or obese. Next slide, please. Second area of focus, healthy child and family development with a goal of promoting access and utilization 
of preventive health care across the lifespan to improve healthy child and family development. Uh, we know that the well-being of mothers and infants and children um, is important for the health of future generations, um, and preconception and interconception care are critical um, in, in ensuring health of future generations. Next slide, please. Some of the objectives that we're looking at here focus on prenatal care, um, increased planned pregnancies to decrease the risks of closely spaced or unintended births, healthy weight um, pre and during pregnancy, an increase in exclusive breastfeeding, and an increase in preventive care um, and vaccine rates for infants. Next slide, please. Safe communities. We know that when we feel safe in our communities, we're more inclined to make choices that are healthy. Um, this relates to sidewalks and lighting. It relates to safe places to play. It relates to our communities being crime-free. Um, it relates to zoning. And it even relates to the safety in our own homes. So we have a goal to develop community to find safe neighborhoods by identifying and implementing local and global best practices through community empowerment. The focus here is on reducing injury and promoting safety across the board. Next slide. As measured by these objectives, uh, an increase in the resolution to 311 calls, a reduction in the number of pedestrian crashes with automobiles, a reduction in the number of family violence incidents and confirmed victims of child abuse and neglect, a decrease in the number of bicycle accidents, and a reduction in the violent crime rate. Next slide, please. Behavioral and mental well-being. So we know uh, mental health and substance abuse are related um, to how we think, how we feel, how we act, and we know that stigma continues to be a barrier to accessing care. The goal here is to improve and expand a comprehensive integrated behavioral health system to provide holistic services with access for all. Next slide, please. The objectives here, um, decreasing pre uh, preventable emergency room use due to behavioral health conditions, um, ensuring a full range of behavioral health services in the community, and we see a couple of developmental objectives here uh, to begin to establish a baseline and monitor and track progress around um, strengthening access to holistic behavioral health services and increasing community awareness of, of issues and available resources. Next slide, please. And last and certainly not least, sexual health. The good news is that the teen birth rate is declining. Uh, unfortunately, the teen birth rate is still 46% higher than the national rate um, here, and that is something that we need to confront and address. The goal of sexual health is to ensure that all Bear County community members of any sexual orientation or gender identification have access to culturally appropriate education and resources to promote sexual health. Um, next slide, please. If you look at the um, objectives for sexual health, we have a developmental objective to increase awareness and use of the mobile app for sexual health. So not only is it developmental, it's technology-based. Um, to continue um, reading along to decrease the teen birth rate and, and reduce uh, the incidence of sexually transmitted infections, including um, the incidence of new um, HIV infections. So um, I hope you see that uh, with the focus of these plans, these are much more streamlined and measurable um, objectives. Um, the data and targets are included in the CHIP, um, and I'm hoping, again, that this will be a living document. Um, planning is a process, it is not an event. Um, so the more conversations that you have, uh, the more that you integrate your work, um, the better the process will be. So thank you so much. And Laura, is Laura here? Thank you all.
and Dr. Lekirin is not here yet, but I want to tell you briefly that the community, you, spoke clearly that it was important to continue to be engaged in this process. And not just to have a dashboard that said, here is what we're doing, and we check it periodically, like once a quarter, maybe once a year, or when we meet you again here, to see how much we've done. But rather, to have a site, a portal, in which not only do we reflect back what the data points are, but how they're changing, but who's engaged, who is doing every day those things that make a difference in this community health improvement plan. This is not just a plan. As Rose said earlier, we are here to talk about not a reaction to this plan, but what action we're going to continue to take. So you'll be hearing more about this portal, this dashboard, because we're going to be engaging everyone to come up with a name that really reflects your engagement. So with that, let me call the panel up so we can continue our, our morning and uh, invite them to come up. And as you see on your agenda, it says that this is a reaction to the CHIP. But it's really not a reaction because this community never just reacts. It responds. And that makes the difference. This is a response to community. I see Dr. McCurin walking uh, in the door, so I'll let her tell you a little bit more about this uh, portal that we've been talking about. And um, come on up, Laura. <laughs> Dr. McCurry. I'm sorry, y'all. It's one of those days when I'm trying to violate the laws of physics and, and meet multiple uh, commitments. Um, I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about um, some plans for an online platform of some kind that will help us move this community forward on these indicators. Um, if we can have the next slide. Okay, so, um, I can't walk, which I like to do. I'll stand here and leave. Okay, so originally what we were talking about was an online um, dashboard report card, a way for us to monitor progress over time and also see whether there were um, differences in different subpopulations, age groups, race, ethnicities, um, sub-county uh, geographies like uh, zip codes and census tracts. But also what we heard from the CHIP participants very strongly was that just walk in and meet all my demands. <laughs> um, so people want not just an online report card. They want some kind of online platform that will help them move the needle on these indicators, which, frankly, um, as someone who's been doing community data for a while, we kind of do. We haven't really heard that before. What we've had in the field and also in San Antonio is just an online report card. But changing the indicator for ourselves, uh, maybe we self-manage our own chronic illness or, or obesity, um, reduce our risk factors, handle that for the family, tackle it at the neighborhood level, and then also for the entire county. Next slide. Keep going. I think this whole thing is animated. So originally we said we need a dashboard. And then after three meetings with chip participants, we said, okay, it's not a dashboard. It's not even a little bit like a dashboard because it has this whole action component. And then we realize that what we need is a dashboard, but we also need the steering wheel. You can keep going. The steering wheel, the gas pedal, um, AC <laughs> would be good, a turn signal. <laughs> we need the whole car, okay? So we do need to know where we're going, which direction we're going, how fast we're going, but we've got to figure out a way to drive this thing toward improvement. Next. I think this one's animated too, so if you just want to click all the way through it. It came out very strongly that we want to get upstream of healthcare. We want to um, have a real explicit focus on the socioeconomic determinants of health, the things in our built environment, um, in our social and economic circumstances that determine whether we are vulnerable to or protected from certain health issues. Uh, we want it to be easy to access, it needs to be online, it needs to be mobile friendly. Um, folks who don't have desktop internet access frequently do have a smartphone. It needs to be free. We know it needs to be easy to understand. So we're talking about a bilingual tool here. 
um, a lower literacy level, and at least two, two ways of navigating through the site, probably with tailored content for different audiences. Because the kinds of things that council staff and grant writers and planners might find valuable is not necessarily the kind of thing that a neighborhood association president or um, a mom is going to find helpful. We know we need to go beyond measuring to support the doing. So, and I don't think our field has figured this out yet, and it's going to be a hard nut to crack, but how we connect people to information and resources to move the needle on these indicators in some more substantive way than giving them a list of links to resources, right? Which is typically the way that it's done. Here's where you go for more information, and basically nobody goes. Next. All right. So just to let you know a few things that came out of the, the design conversations, we'll have it organized by goal and then by objective, and Rose laid those out for you just now. We'll chart the objective trend over time, and we'll also roll our progress on each individual objective into um, a summary status for that goal. And we'll have to decide whether we weight each of the indicators individually or whether one counts for more than another one. There's some features that we want to be able to turn on or off, depending on your level of data geekness. Um, we feel like we want to compare there to something. We haven't decided whether that's Texas or the United States or Healthy People 2020. We know we want to be able to see disparities by different subpopulations, like different race ethnicities and different age groups. And we know that we want to see how the issues are distributed differently across the county, because we know, we know that place matters. We want to be able to turn on and off notes or cautions where you need to be careful how you interpret the data, or we need to help people understand why something matters, um, how, why it's meaningful. And then something that's really emerging recently is that we need to know who else is tracking this. Um, this is a major initiative that the CHIP is. Um, I'm sure you're all also aware of SA 2020. And then there's a, a child data report that some of you may have seen uh, that also monitors a lot of these same indicators. So some kind of deliberate effort to crosswalk so that we're not all just working in parallel. Um, many of you who are out here are working with these different initiatives um, on the same indicator, but without the initiatives making any explicit recognition that we're all tackling the same thing. Next. Um, geeky features. <laughs> we want to allow people to export and uh, print the content, so we probably want to have a print-ready summary per indicator or per goal, so they can just knock that out and hand it to someone, right? Um, we want to be able to export the data for manipulation. Um, if you work for an agency that has a, a service area that's a subset of the census tracts in their county, we want you to be able to get that data by census tract and pull just your census tract so you can put that in your grant application or in your strategic plan. We want to allow people just to dump straight out static images like charts, um, graphs, trend lines. Uh, and then also, we're interested in maybe allowing people to follow, like on Twitter, or subscribe to um, a specific goal or objective so that they can get push notifications of changes to that indicator without necessarily having to get push notification on absolutely everything in the chip, right? Um, we'd also like to allow people to form a group around it. Um, the Health Collaborative has limited resources for uh, actually supporting staffing, um, the direct action that it's going to take to move the needle on these indicators. But we believe that we can make it easier for people to get together um, and act collectively on it. And then, of course, this what can you do area. So resources for action at every level. Again, self-management for ourselves, um, so health-related information and education. Um, the Health Collaborative already has the Community Health Bridge. We could uh, map locations of health-related assets, help people discover apps that will help them change their own behavior or the behavior of their family or neighborhood. We want to connect people to each other if they're working on the same issue. 
I think there's some possibility that we could fold in some user-contributed content so that it's not just a one-way flow of information. Um, and I'm talking about some, something more substantive than a calendar. Um, and then maybe build in a communication platform to help people um, beyond that group that I just mentioned around an indicator to help people connect with each other. That may be it. Yeah. So I want to let you all know something that's hot off the press that the Health Collaborative hasn't even heard yet. And I'm sure they're nervous <laughs> while I'm clearing my throat. I facilitated a very similar conversation um, with the United Way's um, Children's Issue Council, which some of you may sit on or be aware of, um, to reimagine that child data report that we've had in Bear County since 2009. Um, it's been a print report that monitors um, not the same indicators over time, but largely the same indicators over time. And we asked, we went back to them and said, what would be useful to you? Let's think this up from scratch, and maybe we'll arrive in exactly the same place and come out with another trifold print report, maybe we won't. So what they said they wanted was an online platform that would give them real-time-ish information about movement in child well-being indicators, and also support their ability to get together and take action for other indicators. I didn't prompt them that. That just arose organically. Much the same thing that SA2020 is trying to do with their website. So the big take home for me is San Antonio as a whole is arriving at this place where we're ready to get together and do something about these indicators. Not just watch them like a thermometer. Wow, it's getting hotter. Wow, it's getting cooler, right? So I don't know that we in the field have figured out how to do this. Um, a dashboard without a steering wheel or a gas pedal is a whole lot easier to build. So we'll probably be coming back to folks like you to help us imagine what, um, what exactly uh, something would look like. This something that's not quite a dashboard that we've been calling a dashboard. So that's all I have on that. It's like a gorilla speech. Get in, get out. <laughs> instead of just clapping for the speaker, stand up and do this more actively. Um, we have a reaction panel here to this chip, but as I said earlier, this is really an action panel. We, this is a response. How are their organizations, they're going to demonstrate how the chip strategies are already aligned with their efforts and what kind of opportunities uh, they have for the participants uh, um, in this community to engage and collaborate 
uh, to bring about change in, our, in the health of our community with families. So I'm going to do a brief introduction of the panelists. They will have five minutes uh, to uh, speak to this issue, uh, and then uh, we will discuss a plan of action for all of us. Uh, I'm going to begin with Andrea Guajardos, who is from Crista Santa Rosa. Uh, she is the Director of Community Health for Crista Santa Rosa and, uh, and, a, doc and a, a doctoral student at the University of Imparted Ward in San Antonio. Um, the focus of her work has been to develop community benefit strategies to increase access to medical homes and other health care services for uninsured adults and children through the use of the culturally competent community health worker model, promotoras. Uh, Lisa Jensen uh, is the, um, currently the Interim Executive Director for NAMI San Antonio. Uh, previously, she was the Executive Director uh, for the Department of Psychiatry at Methodist Healthcare San Antonio, um, and Methodist Healthcare Systems of San Antonio, and she has extensive acute inpatient mental health experience with children, adolescents, and adults. And I don't see her uh, up here, but uh, we will, uh, when she gets here, she will join the panel. Uh, Carol Huber. Uh, Carol Huber is the Director of Regional Healthcare Partnership Facilitation with University Health System in San Antonio, Texas. Under uh, the Texas Medicaid 1115 waiver, she leads the anchor responsibilities for the 20 counties in Region 6, uh, serving as liaison between the Texas Health and Human Services Commission and the 25 providers implementing 128 projects designed to improve health and transform care delivery. Um, we have Jennifer Harriet. Uh, Jennifer uh, Harriet has 20 years of experience working in the public health sector, addressing community health improvement through policy, environmental, and systems change. In her current position as the Assistant Director of Community Health at the San Antonio Metropolitan Health District, Ms. Harriet provides leadership and guidance to the community health section, which include the chronic disease prevention division, teen pregnancy prevention, uh, which is project work, maternal child health, case management, head start, uh, dental health services, um, the WIC program, the baby cafe, uh, a whole lot of things, uh, which supports breastfeeding moms, uh, the mayor's fitness council, um, and uh, school health collaboration. And then we have Ms. Rios from SA 2020. Jessica Rios uh, has received her bachelor's degree in biology at the University of Texas at San Antonio. And prior to SA 2020, she worked at the University of Texas Health Science Center. She's working towards her master's degree in public health and has done a tremendous job with this team and is part of SA 2020. So uh, you each have five minutes uh, to present uh, what you're doing and how you align with this chip and how you can engage this community. Oh, there I am. Uh, from Krista Santa Rosa, um, as many of you know, uh, Santa Rosa has a long history in San Antonio. Um, we're here for, almost, I guess, about 145 years. Um, began our ministry, our healthcare ministry, in uh, 1869. Um, what many of you might not know is that the Sisters of Charity, the Incarnate Word, came here specifically in response to a public health crisis. There was a cholera epidemic that had been ongoing that was resulting in significant loss of life, um, and the community was really in need, and the sisters answered that call and came and created the Santa Rosa Infirmary. Um, so we uh, were sort of at the forefront of the community health improvement back then. Um, so children, as you know, we have the, um, the freestanding Children's Hospital, the Children's Hospital of San Antonio now. Um, so our ministry is always expanding. Um, specifically, we do try to um, create proactive strategies for community health improvement. Um, our Department of Community Health uh, does use community health workers to address the insured in our um, hospitals that come to us who are in need of health care but don't have health coverage to pay for it. Um, so um, then the ACA came along and we created, not Santa Rosa, but Community Coalition. Many of you in this room are part of that um, Enroll SA Get Better Covered um, to address the issue of the uninsured in San Antonio. Uh, Santa Rosa has um, programs that are specifically targeted at some of the objectives that are in the Community Health Improvement Program. Um, we have three WIC clinics uh, that are proud to say have 98% breastfeeding rate among more than 5,000 clients. Our WIC director is here, Cindy. Um, <laughs> um, more than 5,000 clients per month, um, and 98% of those moms are participating in breastfeeding. So we're very proud of that. 
um, our children's mobile unit provides, on average, more than 5,000 vaccinations per year, um, largely um, on school campuses, on the South Side of Town, in Harlandale and Edgewood school districts. Um, and a lot of those kids come to us as undocumented kids, so they're not eligible for shipping Medicaid, and a lot of times we're their only resource for health care. Um, I want to talk a little bit, I know I only have five minutes, but a little bit about Enroll SA Get Better Covered, which is the community coalition that is focused on maximizing enrollment in the health insurance marketplace this year. We're, um, SA 2020 is a big partner, Enroll America, the Health Collaborative, um, all the hospital systems, Baptist, Methodist Healthcare Ministries. Um, and we came together last year because we knew that we needed some strategies to enroll people in the marketplace. Um, we set a goal of enrolling 20,000 people. I'm happy to say that we surpassed that and enrolled 76,000 people. Um, Um, and even better than that, I think, is the, that we created, the coalition, um, created a best practice for enrollment. We held some very large enrollment events um, to, to make sure that we could reach the most number of people. Um, and that best practice has been recognized on a national level. The White House has recognized our coalition um, and, and asked us to share our best practices with people all over the country. And so we're happy to do that and happy to represent San Antonio as a best practice for that. So that is something that we're very proud of. Um, we're in planning for our next open enrollment, which begins November 15th. Um, the U.S. Congressional Budget Office estimates that more than 13 million people are going to enroll this year, which is 5 million more than enrolled last year. So we have a, our work cut out for us, but I think because of the people in this room and the hard work that we've done, we're going to build upon that success. Um, and that relates to this improvement plan because obviously I don't have to tell any of you that access to health care only improves everything that we do in our lives. And so it's going to contribute to the health of this community greatly. Um, other than that, um, thank you for the opportunity to present this, and I appreciate your time. Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today and with these panelists. I'm glad we're speaking from here and not the podium. I was afraid I wasn't going to be able to see over the podium, so I'm happy to sit here. Um, I have some slides there up on the, on the screen. This shows the 20 counties that represent Region 6. Um, of the Medicaid waiver. Um, we do have a table in the back if you have more information about the details of the Medicaid waiver, but it's essentially a, a relatively new program um, negotiated between CMS and HHSC to transform care um, in Texas. Um, one of the programs embedded in that is the DISRIP or Delivery System Reform Incentive Payment Program, and that's what I'm here to talk about today. Um, our 20 counties. Um, there are 25 providers with um, 128 projects valued at a billion dollars over five years that are aiming to transform care and improve health um, in these communities. Our 20 counties, there's some basic um, data there, but I think it's interesting to note that geographically, uh, we're larger than 10 states and in terms of population, larger than 15. So there's lots of good work being done here that's going to impact a lot of people. University Health System is privileged to be the anchor, um, and we are coordinating among those providers um, and with HHSC in, de in the delivery of care. Um, next slide. We these um, are sort of breaks down the types of projects that are being done, and it was real interesting to hear the braid analogy um, just a few moments ago because that's essentially what we are doing through through DISRIP and the Medicaid waiver. And so you can see the different types of projects. Um, by theme, and a big one for us is behavioral health. And so that's what I'm going to primarily focus on um, for the rest of my remarks. But you can see there is lots of work being done in a variety of areas. Uh, next slide. Um, for each of the providers, when they proposed projects, they had to identify which community need was being addressed, and we had identified six um, as a region. And um, if you'll just click one time, you'll see the, the community need number four is highlighted. This is the one related to the need to integrate and provide greater expansion of behavioral health um, with primary care. And so we have um, over 45 projects addressing that need in particular. Um, on the next slide, you can see again who the providers are who are addressing behavioral health in this region. And um, the ones shown there currently are with um, Bear County, and then just a few more clicks, and you can see the other partners that we have out of the rural communities being the community mental health centers. 
Um, on the next slide, we'll talk about the Behavioral Health um, Learning Collaborative. One of the requirements we have as an anchor is to facilitate learning collaboratives among our partners. Um, it's more than just individual partners um, and providers doing their projects. Although it sort of felt like that a little bit because over the last couple years it's taken a lot of effort just to get those projects proposed um, and, and, and kicked off as, as I've got two providers on the panel here who, who can probably speak well to that. Um, we've been very heads down and just getting things implemented and going. But now it's time to really look up and look to each other and find ways to partner to share best practices and learn from each other and we're doing that through a primary care collaborative through um, an effort to reduce preventable readmissions and through behavioral health um, we have a steering committee um, of, of partners who are helping to organize those events um, and those activities and we started out simply with some networking we called it um, it was a version of speed dating or, or what we call the district dash just basically saying who are you what does your organization do what is your district project all about and how can we work together to solve some of our, our shared and common problems and we have um, a, a great resource that I'll, I'll show you how to access in a moment um, but then we, we took this sort of actionable list and said okay what next what can we do um, beyond that um, besides just getting to know each other in the room and we said well we need to really help each other with some project challenges and one of which is is workforce and how do we make sure that there's enough providers in our community to address the behavioral health needs and so we we discussed that and shared some some opportunities for improvement at our recent um, regional health care partnership summit that we had in may uh, but, but even beyond that is where it's, it's getting really exciting and, and our opportunity to partner with the health collaborative um, is through a common aim or a common strategy that we as district performing providers and our colleagues and stakeholders can come together to work on and that's where we are finding ways to align here with the CHIP today. And so I encourage anyone who's interested in, in working with us to, to do this to um, give me your card. We have a sign up sheet at the table in the back um, and attend our collaborative collaborative events as we work together to identify you know the impact we can make together um, to move the dial on these goals um, each of the hospitals participating in the waiver have to report on um, certain metrics which include readmissions um, and then some of those providers actually have monetary incentives tied to making improvements and things like behavioral health readmissions and you can see how things begin to align with the chip and so we are open at this point now to identify what those will be um, I imagine stigma will be a big one clarity child guidance center is a big supporter uh, big partner for us and they have their one in five minds campaign um, if you're not aware of that I encourage you to talk to Rebecca and um, so lots of great opportunities out there for us to collaborate and we're happy to be here today Hi everyone, again my name is Jessica Rios, um, I think there should be slides coming up pretty soon. There it is. There it is. Thank you so much. Um, so you can go to the next slide. So I've been with SA2020 for about seven months, so after seven months you know everything, right? <laughs> Or at least that's just what you tell yourself. <laughs> um, so SA 2020 is a common vision created in September of 2010. About 5,000 people gathered together to say, hey, this is what I want San Antonio to look like in 2020. Um, they decided, you can go to the next slide. They decided that um, they wanted San Antonio to have 11 cause areas. So just for example, some cause areas are health and fitness, um, safety in communities and neighborhoods, uh, better education, just various things like that. Of course, there's 11, but I only named a few of them. Um, in March of 2013, we became a nonprofit, and in September, we released our first progress report. So again, this September, we'll release our second progress report. You can go to the next slide. So this is um, a African proverb that we live by in SA 2020, and as I've been sitting here listening to everyone speak, um, I've heard Rose say it, I've heard Andrea say it, as well as Pilar, that you know everything that we're doing, it's so large and so great that unfortunately we can't snap our fingers like we want to, but we have to grab people as we go, and we all have to go together. So next slide. 
So again, SA 2020 began as the community vision, but has grown into a backbone of collective impact. And so some of the services that we offer, things that we provide are what you see on the screen. So um, we guide the vision and strategy, support collaboration, measure progress, engage the community, um, advocate policy and mobilize funding. Next slide. Um, so just more about guiding the vision and strategy. Um, I'm gonna brag on one of the organizations that I work with, um, San Antonio Teens for Prevention, uh, Pregnancy Prevention Collaborative. They um, have come together. So they're a large group. They, they're private, um, public, they're not-for-profit, they're for-profit. And, and no matter what they do and how they do it, they've managed to lower the teen pregnancy rate. And I'm sure most of you guys um, know their work or are involved in their work somehow, but together they have lowered the teen pregnancy rate. So, so next slide. So supporting some collaboration. So we do that through action networks. Some of our action networks are with Talent Pipeline, Access to Parks and Green Space, Voter Turnout, um, and Roll SA. Next slide. Um, so we engage our community, or I'm sorry, measure progress. <laughs> so some of the ways that we measure progress, um, one of the ways recently was with the help of Enroll SA, um, or through Enroll SA, um, and we partnered with Enroll America, and together we measured the progress. As Andrea said, um, over 76,000 people got enrolled in healthcare this year, and that was something that together we were able to measure and see how we can improve for enrollment period too. Next slide. So engaging the community, um, we do that through our blogs, our social media, but we also do that in other ways. So the next couple of slides that you'll see are different ways that people have engaged the community in health or their education. So go ahead. So the first one was enroll as say where there was the community coming out to say, hey, I want to change my health care. I want to do something about my health. Um, and this second picture is Destination College. These are high school students um, who have filled out the FAFSA saying that they pledge to go to college and not just go to college, but finish. So next slide. Um, of course, we advance policy. Uh, next slide. And of course, we all need funding to do all these great things, right? So mobilizing funding is the last thing. Next slide. So if you guys have any questions on anything I've just mentioned, you can visit our website at www.sa2020.org. Next slide. And again, you know, I just wanted to say, as we've echoed out, everybody plays a piece, they're a piece of a puzzle of this large um, picture that we want San Antonio to look like, and together we can get there. So thank you. Good morning, everyone. It is such a pleasure to be here. It's amazing to me to see so many familiar faces, both the uh, staff and team that I work with at Metro Health, but also community members that we work with day in and day out. So it's just great to see such a large group here. Um, I would like to encourage each of you to go ahead and open up your uh, community health improvement plan again because I am going to um, be reflecting on the specific areas within that community health improvement plan and share some of the initiatives that um, Metro Health is engaged in with many of you as partners um, and the things we're doing to address the objectives that were developed in the community health improvement plan. Next slide, please. So uh, healthy eating, and I have to say, um, very wordy slides, and I apologize. I think that the next time I have uh, an opportunity to present in, on the chip and what we've done, I'm going to do it with pictures so that we can see the, types of, the type of changes we've had in our community over the years. Right now, I've, I've just got words. But um, some of the things that we are working on that are directly impacting healthy eating, right now we have a collaboration of over 20 partners who are working on developing a media campaign to reduce the consumption of sugar-sweetened beverages in our community. You all will be seeing that soon, and many of you are already engaged with us in doing that. We're also leading work sites and communities to implement policies that increase access to healthy eating and to healthy beverages. 
maybe that's through our healthy vending policies, um, through bringing farm to work or farm to community, produce into um, food deserts. So um, lots of work related to that. We're also working with restaurants to expand our Por Vida program. Hopefully many of you know about our Por Vida program. And we're not only working in restaurants now, but we're actually expanding that uh, we're into worksite cafeterias so that people who are at their work can access um, foods that they recognize or have been um, reviewed by our nutritionist and have that mark of this is, this is a healthy uh, meal for you. We're working with the city to include nutrition guidelines and food procurement contracts. Now that sounds extremely boring, but if you think about it, if we can impact what types of food we are agreeing to have in the contracts throughout the city and the food that's provided, whether it's through pre-K for SA or whether it's at our um, summer feeding program for our parks department, you can really, really have a large impact on, on feeding healthier foods to a lot of people. We're co coordinating with the YMCA to implement diabetes prevention and control programs. Two of my staff are here uh, today, Kathy Shields and Jeremy Beer, and they can uh, both provide you with a wealth of information of if any of you have questions about those programs or would like to get more involved with them. Next slide, please. So in terms of active living, I couldn't le put active living and healthy eating on one slide because we really are doing so many wonderful things. Um, we are working with the planning and Mayor's Fitness Council and the Active Living Council to embed health considerations into the comprehensive master plan for the city of San Antonio. So to be able to have an impact on, on the policies that they put into that comprehensive plan we think is going to be very impactful in the, in the years moving forward. We're working with the Mayor's Fitness Council and San Antonio Sports to improve recreational facilities through Spark Park and implementing joint use agreements to make those facilities available to people in their communities so that our schools are no longer locked up at 3.30 when all the kids leave, but people and adults and families in the neighborhoods can actually use the tracks and the playgrounds uh, to, to exercise in the evening and on the weekends. We are um, collaborating with the Parks Department to improve infrastructure and resources to support physical activity. So several years ago through um, the Communities Putting Prevention to Work program, uh, we were able to fund some fitness stations in parks. Well, guess what? It turns out that in the summertime, those metal fitness stations get super hot and hard to, hard to work out at. So we're funding um, shade structures to cover those so that people can be at, use those fitness stations throughout the year. We are also looking at bringing water fountains into um, our parks and some of our other areas in the community so that people have access to drinking you know, fresh tap water when they're out exercising. Uh, so lots of efforts. We are um, continuing to support Ciclovia. Um, hopefully many of you have either participated or know about it and, and if you haven't, you should go to the next Ciclovia. It's a fabulous activity. Um, we are working very closely with the Mayor's Fitness Council. We're sad to see our mayor leave, but we're very excited. I trust that Ivy Taylor will continue to support the efforts of the Mayor's Fitness Council. We're working on translating, um, getting funding to translate the fitcitysa.org uh, website, which is a fabulous website that, that shares not only partnerships and who you can work with in various areas related to fitness and health, um, but also a lot of information. The problem is it's been in English for the last few years. We've got to have it be in Spanish, so we're working on that happening. We are um, supporting and working with our partner Parks Department on fit, Fitness in the Parks, FitPass SA, and other important built environment initiatives. Healthy Child and Family Development. Again, I have um, both Kelly Bellinger and Norma Cifuentes in, this, in the room, so if you have questions about some of these initiatives, they can answer those questions um, after we're done. Uh, we are helping pregnant women and families to make sure their babies are born healthy and stay healthy through the Healthy Start program and through the Healthy Families Network. Uh, we're implementing the Baby Cafe, which is one of our district projects, which encourages breast breastfeeding and provides support to moms because breastfeeding is such an important thing, not only to improve our baby's health, but to also reduce obesity. Um, there's a connection there. We're serving women and children through WIC to ensure healthy moms and healthy families. Uh, and we're working on creating 
uh, mother-friendly work sites so that women who have had a, a newborn like Jessica here feel comfortable breastfeeding or have a place that they can go to either breastfeed their child or pump so that they can continue breastfeeding for as long as they want to even after re returning to the workplace. Uh, we are also pro promoting and providing a case management services for teen mothers through a, an evidence-based initiative to reduce repeat teen pregnancies, to give um, young teen moms a better chance in their future by reducing the possibility of them having a second child in their teen years. Uh, next slide, safe communities. Thank you. Um, we're collaborating, and this is a brand new project, um, with the San Antonio Police Department to implement the the Cure Violence Initiative. It's an initiative that was implemented in uh, Chicago, and it's trying to reduce um, homicides and shootings through a disease prevention model. So it's a very interesting, brand new initiative. Um, we'd love to share more information about that with any of you who are interested. We are partnering with our Office of Sustainability to promote active transportation and bike and pedestrian safety awareness to improve safety in our community. It is so exciting to me to see how many people are out bike riding. There are more and more bikes on our bike lanes and on our streets every single day. People need to be wearing helmets, though, and I'm not seeing a lot of helmets, so we'll have to start working on that. And policy, perhaps, to um, implement an ordinance that requires that, we'll see. We are working with our transportation and capital improvement to develop plans and designate resources for infrastructure and safety improvements. And we have a, a, an initiative that, I, that fits in many different areas, but I put it under safe communities. Um, we're working on community engagement. It's so important to do the policy, the built environment, um, the environmental changes and the systems changes, but we also need to make sure that we're engaging community members and that we're listening to them and that they are leading us in our efforts in the community. And so our neighborhoods project, again funded through the DISRIP, um, is a DISRIP uh, project. Um, is there to implement community-led health improvements and address health disparities. Next slide, and my almost final slide. Uh, sexual health, if you look at that community health improvement plan, there's some issues that we are real, that are very, very important to this community that we are trying to address. And so we are currently partnering with many to implement an evidence-based teen pregnancy, STD and HIV prevention program to educate adolescents. Again, I've got Mario Martinez in the room who um, oversees our Project Worth program, and Dr. Anil Mangla, who is the assist another assistant director at the health department here, who are working on these projects. We're expanding access to affordable reproductive health care services for adolescents. We are conducting clinical case management and case investigations of all high-risk pregnant women to assure appropriate prenatal care and third trimester syphilis screening to prevent congenital syphilis cases. And finally, we are conducting education and outreach to local medical providers to encourage the adoption of third trimester syphilis testing among all pregnant women. We've had a problem with the number of babies born with congenital syphilis. We've got to bring that down to zero. There's no, there's no excuse. Um, Mickey Maxwell is another person out there in the, in the audience who doesn't like a lot of recognition, but she's our school health liaison and supports every one of these initiatives that I've mentioned. But the bottom line is this, we couldn't do any of this work if we weren't partnering with the majority of you who are in the room. And so I just, this morning as I was thinking about this, I thought of a couple of quotes. Um, one by Helen Keller, some of you may have heard. Um, Alone we can do so little, to, together we can do so much. It's pretty simple, collaboration. Um, another one, and my last one in closing remark, is coming together is a beginning. Staying together is progress and working together is success. Henry Ford said that. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much uh, to our panelists, and working together is indeed success. So it's your turn now. It's time for you to, we, we have actually, put this in the agenda because we consider this piece so, so important. Because we will have closing remarks at the end, but for the next 15 minutes, we want you to make sure that you look into your packets and you have a little survey. This survey is very important to us 
Notice it does not have a name at the top, but if you answer question five, would you like to be part of the CHIP work group in the future, make sure that you put your contact information. And when you finish, the Health Collaborative people are wearing their shirts. You can either hand it to them or leave it at the table. Uh, as you walked in when you registered, uh, you can leave it there. But make sure that you complete this form. And then the other very, very important initiative that we ask you to take today is to walk over to these tables, these organizations that you have heard from and others, and see how you can sign up to get your organization or you personally involved with the projects that you've heard about. And get involved with your own others here that have other projects that are not here at the table, but the, you know, the call to action is really about how each and every one of us can continue to make that progress and make it happen, because that is indeed success. Thank you, Jennifer, for saying that I, I, as a concluding remark for the action piece, um, but I ask you now, please fill this out and please visit the tables. We will reconvene everyone in about 15 minutes. Thank you.